Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. Um, it's wonderful that you could join us today. We're really happy to have you back in some people's cases um, or joining us for the first time. So first, I would like to welcome you to the second webinar in our series, COVID-19 in Context, News Coverage and News Literacy in Uncertain Times. My name is Sunshine Menezes. I'm the Executive Director of Metcalf Institute at the University of Rhode Island. We're bringing you these webinars in partnership with the News Literacy Project, a nonpartisan national education nonprofit that provides educators with tools and resources to teach their students how to navigate today's complex information landscape, learn to judge the credibility of information for themselves, and become engaged and informed participants in our democracy. Metcalf Institute's mission is to engage diverse audiences in conversations about science and the environment through webinars like this, and by providing education, training, and resources for journalists, researchers, and other science communicators. On behalf of Metcalf Institute, I'd like to thank the Ruth and Hal Launders Charitable Trust for supporting this series. The COVID-19 pandemic is an unprecedented challenge in many respects. In addition to the havoc and trauma it has caused in our personal lives, it has challenged our governance, public health, and economic systems from local to global scales. The daunting scientific uncertainties about the virus and the ways we've been inundated with information, some good and some bad, have fueled one of the most urgent science communication challenges of our time. This four-part webinar series will bring together journalists and news, uh, excuse me, news literacy education experts and scientists to explore all of these issues. Uh, we hope you will join us for the remaining webinars in the series. Uh, the next one on Thursday, we'll talk about how to fact check like a pro. And then on May 5th, next Tuesday, um, we'll talk about how to make sense of scientific uncertainty. So you can see the link in the chat to register for the rest of the series. Now, I'd really like to um, welcome our, our speaker for the day, and that is Mr. John Silva. Um, okay, too many buttons to push at one time. Um, we rely on local and national news to get the facts we need to make informed decisions about our health and safety, but how do we identify credible sources, and what's the best way to ensure that the information we're getting is accurate? So to discuss this today is John Silva, the News Literacy Project's Director of Education. He joined the News Literacy Project in March 2017 with 13 years of experience as a history teacher with Chicago's public schools, including seven years at the Lindblom Math and Science Academy, one of Chicago Public Schools system's top selective enrollment schools. He began working with the News Literacy Project while he was at the Lindblom Academy, where he implemented the curriculum in his eighth and 11th grade history classes. So now I'm going to turn this over to John so he can tell us about some critical news literacy skills. John. Um, great, thank you so much. Uh, I'm really excited to be here talking about this. Um, ordinarily, this is a topic that we discuss with teachers in professional development, but um, I've kind of adapted it as a way of talking about some skills and habits that really anybody can use um, in terms of you know, how we encounter and interact with information. Um, and hopefully not only being reliably informed, but uh, finding some ways of helping slow the stop of misinformation, especially in this really crazy time that we find ourselves in. Um, so, um, as mentioned, so I'm a former classroom teacher, um, 13 years in Chicago public schools. Um, my Twitter handle is here. Um, I like to share that with you in case you're interested in following. Um, I do tweet a lot about misinformation um, and news literacy. Um, of late, I've been doing a lot of work on conspiracies and uh, conspiratorial thinking. Um, so on, on social media, I do try to share a lot of resources uh, along those lines. Um, so first I wanna talk about what we mean when we say news literacy, um, because there's a lot of different ways that people can perceive it just from the phrase. And so this is how we define it at the News Literacy Project. At its basic definition, it's really about knowing what we can verify or what we can trust to be credible and, and what's not. And part of that is understanding and really prioritizing 
journalism from reliable um, news organizations and journalists that follow the standards of quality journalism. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what some of those standards are. But if we're talking about being reliably informed and, and knowing what we can trust, understanding what some of those standards are and what it looks like uh, from those news organizations is really important. Plus, it's also really about understanding what we do with the information um, that, we, that we learn, how we share it in responsible ways, and how that information uh, is really important in being an active and engaged uh, citizen. When we talk about this with educators, it's a key part of when we talk about civic engagement, making sure students know how to be reliably informed to make those kinds of informed decisions. Um, I'm going to show you some examples um, to kind of highlight uh, some of the challenges of the problems that we're struggling with in terms of misinformation and being reliably informed. Um, this is an example that we just pushed, uh, put out in our, our newsletter, The Sift. Um, this is an example of, a, of an unsubstantiated rumor that can spread very easily and very quickly on social media. Uh, this is completely false, uh, but you can see that when we took this screenshot, it had been retweeted 20,000 times, had over 40,000 likes, um, and it's this kind of a rumor that feeds into perceptions and beliefs about political positions um, that can share, be shared really quickly um, and reach a lot of people in a very short period of time. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of this type of misinformation that's out there. Another that we also see, and this has been a problem for a number of years, just in general, um, is hyper-partisan propaganda. Um, this is an example from Instagram. Um, it's, you know, this type of a, an image-based, you know, meme-based uh, piece of political propaganda, again, is, is still very easy to share. Um, and it's one of those things that can just pop up randomly based on, you know, maybe some of the people you follow or some of your, some of the things that you've liked. Um, but this is another example that can, that can pop up on your social media feed. Um, I'm going to show you this, another example when we talk about conspiracy theories. Um, especially today with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, there are some very dangerous conspiracy theories and beliefs that are being shared on social media. Um, they run the gamut from, you know, for example, this, that the COVID-19 uh, virus was manufactured for vaccines. Uh, we see things relating to 5G. So there's a lot of these very dangerous conspiracy theories that are spreading uh, dangerous information. And I apologize for the, the uh, sound outside. Um, finally, there's this, uh, another one, and this is a point, this is the third. Um, a lot of people don't realize that TikTok is not just funny dances and people doing lip syncs. So this is one of those, this is an example where, on, even on TikTok, so this is uh, obviously an anti-vaccine. This is something that can easily be shared, just like on other social media platforms. Um, and the, the, the misinformation on TikTok is very similar to what you find in a lot of other places. Um, but it's becoming very popular, and I think especially dangerous because the main audience for a, a lot of TikTok is younger people. And then the thing I want to emphasize about this is that we don't want to talk about news literacy and talk about a specific platform um, because it actually doesn't really matter what platform we're encountering information on. Um, if the skills that we are we want to learn and we want to apply can be used for applying information, uh, evaluating information on any of these. So it's really about evaluating and being critical about the content and the source of that content not what platform it came across on. And so I wanna just put this question out here for, for each of you to, to consider for a second. If one of these pops up on your social media feed and you decide to, to, to Google it, what kind of information do you think you're gonna find? Um, what types of sources are you gonna find? Um, and most of you are probably realizing that you would probably find some, some very problematic and troubling misinformation. But think about this from the perspective of a younger person who's searching some of these for the first time. This is one of the, the things that makes our mission so very important at the News Literacy Project is that we're really focusing on middle and high school students because they are very naturally curious. And if they Google these claims, 
uh, we want them to be able to evaluate that information and, and be able to verify what is true and what is not. Um, and so this sort of highlights the, you know, the breadth of the problem in, in some really important ways. Um, and so part of the question that we, we ask, um, when we ask this of teachers, we ask them, you know, can your students tell the difference between fact and fiction? And this is where I would like each of you to kind of take a moment and think, how well do you think you can sort through some of these things? Um, because I think it's, it's fairly safe to say that a lot of us have been fooled by a piece of misinformation at one time or another, because there's just so much of it out there. So I wanna go through and talk about some of these essential skills and some tools that we can use um, for how we can be more reliably informed. Um, the first one is recognizing and understanding when we're having a strong emotional reaction to something. Um, often the first warning sign that what we're looking at is a piece of misinformation or worse is a strong emotional response. Um, because that's what misinformation is designed to do. Misinformation is all about manipulating our emotions so that we react and share it and spread it as opposed to pause and, and really think about it. Because when we have that strong emotional response, our brains kind of um, go, go a little bit into autopilot that the, um, when we have a strong emotional response, the rational parts of our brains are not really all that engaged. Now for most adults, fortunately, the rational parts of our brains will, will kick in fairly quickly and we'll think about it and hopefully we'll pause before we share it. But when we talk about who's most vulnerable to this, it's really adolescents and older people because it's, it's all about brain development. When, we talk, when I talk to teachers, we, we, we talk about how the rational centers of the brains are the last to develop and it's not even fully developed in about the mid 20s. So when we talk about adolescents, they're really only using the emotional centers of their brains. And so they're very easy to manipulate. And it's also true that for the elderly, for older people, when we talk about um, how the brain changes in our later years, um, it's almost a reverse. So some of, those, some of the rational centers of the brain starts to decline early. Um, but it's also that the older you are, sort of the more set in your beliefs you are. So if something resonates with you and something you believe strongly, um, you're going to be more, more uh, apt to share something very quickly without thinking about it. So understanding those emotional responses is something that's really important. It's a, it's a huge warning sign that we want to always be aware of. Um, the second, and I think this is, I go back and forth about which one should be one and which one should be two. Um, and this is a skill that I, I wish I could sort of sprinkle into everyone's brains is understanding the differences between news and opinion. And this is very difficult in a lot of ways because especially when you look at national television news media, it is overwhelmingly skewed towards opinion. Um, and it's, it's one of those things that the transition between news and opinion in a lot of these news sources is so seamless that we don't often recognize it. Um, so when we're talking about being reliably informed, we really wanna figure out how can we um, emphasize news and minimize the opinion pieces because opinion pieces are trying to persuade us. They're trying to manipulate us in some way. So we have an app called Informable, which I'll share a link to a little bit later. Um, these are some examples from our, our app that where we, this is one of our things that we use to teach um, is about news and opinion. So when you see this, um, you can see that there are some telltale signs um, about this being an opinion piece, right? It says it's from the editorial board. The, the Twitter handle is post opinions, um, and we can see that pretty easily. This example doesn't have those labels. And so we actually have to look at it a little bit more closely um, to look at the, the wording, uh, the tone, and how, it, how the headline and the lead are structured. Um, so in a lot of ways, the, one of the first things that we need to do is to, look, is to actually look for signs that something is an opinion. Because in, in a way, news is the absence of a lot of these things, right? So um, opinion pieces, commentary from reputable news organizations will be labeled. Um, so we should look for those labels. But it's also about the wording of, of, the, of the piece that we're reading. Opinion pieces are often in first person. Um, they use a lot of persuasive language um, and just generally the tone. So when we look at a news piece, um, there are some of these, these standards that we wanna be looking for 
Um, so partly news is the absence of a lot of those things, but it's also about some of what we call the, these key standards. A news piece will verify its information and tell you how that information was verified through multiple sources. Um, the overall tone um, and the, the wording of the article will, will be, have this idea of fairness, will present full, uh, multiple perspectives on what's being told. Um, you should be able to see evidence of accountability and transparency. So for example, when the Washington Post writes an article about Amazon, um, they will say, they will remind people that, you know, the Washington Post is owned by Jeff Bezos. Um, and a quality journalism, a quality news piece will also provide context so that you can understand uh, a lot of what is, what is in there. Um, so there's two different ways of approaching these, but understanding the differences between news and opinion is a really critical skill that we need to practice so that we know what it is that we're looking at. Um, now, this is going to be a really tricky one, um, talking about bias. So in a second, I'm going to launch a poll question. Um, and I'm going to show you a series of headlines. And we're going to try to make this um, a little interactive. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some headlines for some, from a recent news uh, event. And it's, the, the questions are going to be fairly simple. It's going to be about whether or not you perceive um, bias. Uh, so here's the first. Here's the first headline, uh, USS Theodore Roosevelt Commander Relieved of Duty. Uh, so I'm gonna pop this, this poll question up and I'm just gonna put this up here for a second. And so really this is just about perception. Do you perceive bias in this headline? Okay, that's pretty, that's pretty definitive. Looks like about 75% of people are saying no. Okay, cool. So now remember this headline. Um, I'm gonna show you the second headline. Same news event, different, different source. Navy removes aircraft carrier captain uh, who raise alarm about coronavirus response. So the question here is going to be, is this headline more biased, less biased, or about the same as the first? Okay, this looks like we got about 60-ish percent of people who are saying that it's uh, more biased, okay? All right, I'm gonna show you one more. This will be the third. Um, and I'm gonna ask that same question again. Commander of aircraft carrier hit by coronavirus removed for poor judgment after sounding alarm. So considering the first two, is it more, is it less, or is it about the same? Okay, so it looks like we're trending towards this being the most, this is definitely looking to be more biased, about 70%. Okay. Now I'm going to show you all three. So we're looking at all three of these headlines. And so what I want to know, what, I, what I'm gonna ask is, um, which of these three headlines, so now that you're able to see all three of these together, which headline do you think is the most biased? Oh, wow. So about 90% are looking at the third one. Okay. Dropping down to about 83. Okay. That's good to know. Okay. So I want to talk about what, what, what's going on with this. So the, the most important word in these questions um, that I've been asking is about perception. Um, and so the, the tricky thing is, is that when, when I, when, if I ask you, do you perceive bias? You know, we're talking about perceptions. And obviously perception is something that's very personal and it's, it can be influenced by a lot of different factors. When we wanna talk about bias, 
Um, we actually want to talk about things, try to find ways to talk about in a more objective way. Um, so there are some questions that these raise when we're, when we're looking at headline, when we're looking at an article and we're asking about, we want to ask some questions before we really make some determinations about bias. Um, so the first thing is I go, am I looking at something that's news? Um, if I look at a headline and I discover that it's a piece of commentary or an opinion piece, then questions of bias are almost pointless because by their very definition, they're going to be biased in some way or another. Um, so if we're going to talk about bias, and we really want to focus on these questions as it relates to news. Um, the second thing that comes up is when we're looking at these headlines, are they accurate? Are these actually factual details um, about what happened? Or, or am I kind of reading into the language a little bit um, and focusing on one or two words or a certain phrase and calling that bias, but in reality, it's actually something that's factual. Um, and if we're talking about bias, can we actually explain it in a way that makes sense that's from a, a, a way of, of objective evaluation, not necessarily just subjective belief? Uh, because we also want to think about if it's, if it's subjective and it's our perception, you know, we could be projecting some of our own biases on these. So I'm going to show you this. Here are the sources for these headlines. Now, these are all straight news pieces that I got from these three news sources. Um, and the reason I didn't show you the news logo before was that had I showed you the news logo, that certainly would have skewed the results for some of those poll questions because we would have been projecting some of our perceptions about these news organizations onto the headlines. And so a lot of times when we talk about these headlines, um, some people say the first one is the least biased because it has, it's, it's just straight to the point. It's, it's, it doesn't have a lot of detail. And when people look at the third one, um, they say by including that quote of poor judgment um, that that's sort of expressing a bias. But the reality is, is that's actually uh, the, one of the reasons why that commander was relieved of duty according to the Department of the Navy. So that's actually a, a factual piece of information from the news event. So we want to talk about these, these things in a way that's a little more objective. So at the News Literacy Project in our Checkology Virtual Classroom, which is our learning tool that, that educators can use, we have a lesson called Understanding Bias. And the way that we, we talk about it is this, first we talk about these seven types. So we define seven types of bias that are common in news coverage. And so we talk about what, what these, how they're different, um, how we define it. So we wanna to come to an, an objective way of measuring. And then we talk about the forms. So how these types sort of express themselves. Um, and so these are some ways of defining bias in ways that gives us a bit, a bit closer to that objective way of evaluating and measuring bias. So these conversations can be very tricky and they can, they can be very difficult sometimes because we have sort of strong opinions about news events and news sources. This is a way that we can, where we can try to take a step back and like I said, just be a little bit more objective about bias. Um, when we're talking about news sources and news organizations, many of you may have seen these charts. Um, these are media bias charts. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to map out these different news organizations and sources of information based on uh, perceived political bias. Um, these are very popular in a, lot of, in a lot of places. You see them somewhat regularly on social media. But they are a little problematic. Um, one of the things is that it, a lot of these charts don't take into account the difference between the news happens on one side of the, the newsroom and the opinion pieces. So part of it is these charts are about the, the opinion writers, the editorial boards, but it's also about the, our, our general perceptions. Some sources that are on here, especially those that are on the far left and far right, they're not trying to be news sources. They're all about commentary and opinions and in many cases propaganda. So they're not trying to be objective or minimizing bias. They're actually trying to maximize bias in some examples. Um, and again, they are very subjective. Um, they can be debatable in lots of different ways. Um, and the, the other challenge is, is that it does sort of discourage our own critical evaluation of these sources because it presents us in this simplified way, um, but really takes a very complex issue and, and, and I think it oversimplifies it. Um, so really it's about some of these ideas about being more critical about how we evaluate these sources and how we prioritize information from some, from some of these, these organizations. Um, okay, another skill that's really important is about evaluating something to see if there's actually evidence to support what it claims. 
Um, this happens a lot, and there's been a lot of research to show that for young people in particular, this is a skill that is very difficult for them because um, a lot of people tend to take things at face value. So here's one example. This is another mode from our informable app um, where you see this claim pop up about margarine being one molecule away from plastic. Um, and you might take a look at that and have, have a reaction where you're like, oh my God, that's kind of scary. But again, that emotional reaction is sort of overriding a critical evaluation where you're looking at that like, okay, so how, where, where's your evidence? Where's the proof of this? Whereas this example from the Pew Research Center um, is giving us um, uh, some information from their studies. And so they're giving us evidence in two ways here. The first is we have the chart that we can evaluate that's in the post. The second is a link that will take us to an article where they explain more about how they got their information. And so this, is, this really emphasizes um, so a couple of the things that we wanna look at. One is that there should be evidence in the post itself that we can look at, but there also should be a way for us to look at where that evidence came from, how it was presented, um, and, and so that we can really understand what it is that we're looking at, and we can evaluate um, the validity of what, what is being uh, shown to us. Um, here's an example from uh, Twitter. This is a trend, this is a, a viral trend that's been going on for several weeks. Um, you can see in the, in the video here, this is a, a shot on a cell phone looking at outside of a hospital. This hashtag film your hospital has been trending off and on for a couple of weeks where people are claiming that the COVID-19 pandemic is not nearly as bad as people are suggesting. Um, and this video that is being shown to us is supposed to be evidence that um, that it's not a problem, that you know, it's not, there's not these war zones. But there's a couple questions like, yes, it's a video, but we have no idea like who shot it, where it was shot. We can't evaluate any of those things for ourselves. The person who posted this just wants us to take it at face value. Um, and so this is, a, this is another example where um, people would respond to this. You can see this one had almost 22,000 retweets and almost 34,000 likes. Uh, so there's a lot of engagement and it just feeds a lot of these, some of these beliefs, political beliefs, but we need to take a step back and really look at some of these things critically. Um, the Stanford History Education Group um, has done a lot of research in this, in this area um, and they have, they've uh, created some questions to look at. So these are questions that we want our, to be sort of practice for ourselves. Um, you know, who's the source? What's the credibility of the claim? Can I verify who the source is? Can I look at the evidence itself? Um, is the source of that evidence credible? Um, and then if those first two are, we find those first two to be credible, then it's, then it's about the connection between the evidence and whatever is being claimed, um, and if there is proof. And so this, is, this, this seems like a lot of questions, but it's really about taking the time to really do some fact checking and verification for ourselves when we're doing this. Um, and how do we do that? Um, so one of the ways that we can do fact checking is through what we call lateral reading. Um, so for example, here's, a, here's a, a post from earlier this year where somebody claimed that this is a quote from Ronald Reagan. Um, I'll tell you, anytime you see a quote from a famous person that is um, oddly really on point, um, that's a red flag that you should be aware of. Um, so how would I check this? So what lateral reading is, lateral reading is, is sort of a way of a deliberate uh, internet search. Um, it's not just about typing in random things. It's about doing it in a way that, that will sort of maximize getting quality results. So some of that is, for example, if you, it's a quote, put the quote in quotation marks. So the search engine will search for that exact term using plus and minus signs to require or exclude certain terms. Um, so being, doing a deliberate search is a really important part of this. But then it's also about what we call click restraint. What that means is that don't just click on the first link that pops up really look through the results that pop up on that search results and try to figure out which one you think might be, give you the most relevant and hopefully the most reliable information. And then we apply some of those evaluation skills to those sources. Um, and the thing is, is you might, you might debunk it very quickly or it might be verified very quickly. But really, if you really want to check something out, you want to keep searching until you feel comfortable and confident that you've determined whether or not something is true. Uh, I'm just going to show you this quick, this quick video. Here's a, a screen recording of how I did this. So I typed in, uh, I just typed this in as a form of a question. Uh, so I said, did Ronald Reagan call Nancy Pelosi evil? 
So Google in particular is getting pretty good with their algorithms in terms of prioritizing what they think you're doing a fact check. So you can see the first three results here are fact checks. Um, so in this one, I'm going to go to factcheck.org. Um, and I'm not just going to take whatever they say at face value. They're going to give me the quick take. They're going to give me some context. But if a quality fact check is going to actually show their work, they're going to tell me where they got their information from. They're going to uh, provide information about where they, where they found uh, the information. And so really, we want to emphasize the importance of not just taking any source at face value, but it's really about drilling down and thinking about what it is that we want to prioritize. So a quality fact check in particular is important. We don't want to just accept any fact check. We really want to look to make sure that they're, they're showing their work and then we can evaluate some of it for ourselves. Um, another fact checking tool that's really important that you can start using right away is called the reverse image search. Since a lot of misinformation is image or meme based, uh, a reverse image search can be a very effective tool for fact checking some claims. So what a, re a reverse image search is, um, basically what it's going to do is it's going to try to match the pixel pattern of that image with the images in the search database. And it's going to try to show you the images that either match or are as close as, they, as the algorithm thinks it is. Um, there are three that are very popular. Google uh, Images has a, qual has a good one. TinEye is another. And then Yandex um, is a third. Um, and a lot of times, I try to search all three if I'm, if I'm trying to uh, search an image. Um, and there are multiple ways of doing it. Um, but again, just like with lateral reading, you want to exercise click restraint. Um, you want to go through the results. So I'm going to show you what this looks like really quickly. So here's an image that, pop, that has popped up off and on over the last couple of years, um, claiming that this is Che Guevara, um, about to, seemingly about to execute two young women. Um, and you can see that it's very popular. It's been, um, it's been shared multiple times in multiple places, um, but it feeds into a particular viewpoint, particularly about socialism, or in some cases, just people who are perceived as being liberal. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you how this works. So here's a, a screen recording. Um, the simplest way, if you're on your computer, um, is to take your mouse, right click over the image, and then you're going to see an option that says search Google for image. And that's going to launch the reverse image search. And again, I'm going to exercise click restraint. And I'm going to go through the results. And I'm going to try to see, because we have a Snopes article. Then we have a Wikipedia article, which is probably not going to be helpful. But on the bottom section here, um, Google's going to show me pages that have matching images. So I'm going to go to this fact check from the AFP. So they're going to tell me right away that it's false. But I'm not going to stop there. I want to go through again and evaluate these results. And I want to make sure that um, I can trust what AFP is telling me. And so they're going to provide some, some background, some context, um, some, a little bit of explanation about uh, where it came from. So we actually discovered that it's actually from, um, it's actually uh, more than two decades old. Um, it's from the Guerrilla Theater at Emory College. It was taken in 1989. Um, and they're actually also going to show a link to where we can see that for ourselves if we wanted to open that up. So AFP has investigated it. They've determined that it's false. They're showing us the images side by side. And they're really giving us a lot of information to be able to trust that this is a quality fact check. And that image, in fact, um, is a piece of what we call false context misinformation. So they took a, a real image and they've added a caption to change its context and have created a piece of misinformation. Um, another one that's kind of tricky, um, but I really feel it's important to mention is satire. Um, there is a great deal of satire out there. Um, there are some pretty amazing satire sites that I, that I enjoy. Um, but the challenge is, is that um, increasingly satire is becoming very political, more political than it was, um, but also difficult to recognize in some ways. So I'm going to show you some examples. So here's one from The Onion. Um, this is one that we normally would associate with the onion. It's a little over the top in its ridiculousness, um, and it's pretty funny. Um, and most people would sort of recognize right away that that's uh, a piece of satire, even if we don't really remember who the onion is. But like a lot of other sites, the onion has been getting more political in recent, in recent years. And so you can see how having an emotional reaction to the political piece here, we may miss um, the fact that it's from the onion, and we may share it um, thinking that it's real. 
again, that emotional response, we may, we may respond to it very quickly. Um, another one that's, that's uh, is actually kind of fooling people fairly regularly is the Babylon Bee. Um, it's not as well known as the onion and it, they do tend to be very political. Um, and so people will share this and retweet it as if it's a real news source, not realizing that it's a satire site. But it's not just these satirical uh, publications or sites that are, that are important. So you can see here the Babylon Bee, they actually label themselves fake news you can trust. Um, some of these sites are not as well labeled, but there's another kind of satire that's becoming very popular um, that may not, we may not recognize right away. So I'm sitting here on a Friday night enjoying my ice cold beer. And what do I see come across to my Fox News? The CDC wants you and me and God and everybody else to wear a face mask. And that just pisses me off. Making me and everybody take precautions to protect ourselves. What am I supposed to do now that all the masks are gone? So that type of, that type of, so this is from a comedian, Brent Terhune. That's a character that he's created. And he puts about, he puts up about a video or so a week, um, all in that character. And if you go through some of the, his tweets and his posts, um, and you look at the way people are interacting with him, replying to him, sharing it, a lot of people believe that that's a real person who's a real Trump supporter, not recognizing the sort of over the top nature of the comedy, and not actually even taking the time to click on the, the profile to learn a little bit more. Um, so the thing, the thing about satire is that we do have to recognize that satire is actually a type of misinformation. Um, it's just using a different emotional response to be shared um, because have, you know, laughing at something, uh, thinking something is ridiculous, that's also an emotional response. Um, but it's also important to know that sometimes if we see a satirical uh, post or article, we, it may be shared with us out of context. We may just have that video, for example, without the account, or maybe just part of the article without knowing where it came from, um, because it can often be plagiarized and shared out of context. And so we always have to be careful. But it's also about things like people who will post things that are satiric, that maybe they weren't intending it for it to be satirical, um, but calling something satire after the fact is kind of a, a defense for some types of misinformation. Um, and the thing is, we have to evaluate these things just as, as thoroughly as we do other pieces of information. We need, to, we need to check out the source, we need to check out the claim, and most of these things can be debunked and identified as satire very, very quickly. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna pose a couple of questions for you to think about, um, and then we'll pause for Q&A. Um, so these are some questions that, that for you to sort of consider for yourselves. Um, in terms of the context of these skills and, uh, and concepts that I've shared with you. Um, so the first, uh, when we think about ourselves and our social media feeds, um, how will these skills and these tools apply to sort of our day-to-day -day social media consumption? So as I'm scrolling through Twitter, I'm scrolling through my Instagram feed, which of these can I use or should I use when I'm trying to evaluate information? So part of this is on us. Uh, individually. So how do we do this to make sure that we're not sharing misinformation inadvertently? Um, the other, if you have kids, um, how can you talk to them about some of these things? Um, because young people are getting phones at younger and younger ages. Um, they're, they're engaged on social media. You know, especially young kids right now, TikTok is hugely popular and there is a great deal of misinformation and conspiracy theories on TikTok. And there's some very dangerous misinformation as well. Um, so how, how can you talk to them? So one of the things that we, you know, I, would, I would mention, we have some resources that we can share um, for educators, but also for parents who want to talk to talk to kids about some of these skills. And then finally, we all have people in our family um, or friends that we know that are probably known to share things without really thinking. We all have probably that one uncle who has the crazy conspiracy theories or the strong view, you know, political viewpoints that they share without really thinking. Um, how can we model some of these? So, as a, and, and I say model in the sense that not so much that we wanna be confrontational about this, but how can we show them how these things are done by doing them ourselves? Um, and so part of this is thinking about how as through individual actions, we can actually reach other people and show others how to use some of these tools. So if we fact check something, and we know that it's not true, we can tell people exactly how we did that. 
as opposed to just being sort of confrontational saying, well, no, that's not true. You shouldn't have shared it. Um, so the last, I'm gonna sort of close with these and then go into Q&A. When we talk about news literacy, this isn't really just an academic exercise that we want to, that we want to teach. It's, it is actually a 21st century survival skill in a lot of important ways. Um, because when we talk about our civic life, when we talk about the decisions that we make, information is at the heart of everything. If we're not reliably informed, we're not gonna make reliable decisions. Um, so being reliably informed and knowing how to prioritize reliable information is absolutely critical. Um, second, we also we all know that right now, this is an incredibly complex and sometimes overwhelming um, information landscape. There's so much information that washes over us all day, every day. These skills um, can really help us figure out how to filter through that to prioritize the things that we really want to know um, and can in some ways cut down on a lot of that noise. And then finally, when we practice these skills, um, we can actually help contribute to slowing the spread of misinformation in really important ways. Um, and that's one of the most important things that we want to get out of this. The first is that we want people to be reliably informed and prioritize quality journalism. The second is that we want to help spread the slow of misinformation and those go together. So um, I'll pause here and we'll go into uh, some questions. Great, thanks so much, John. That was super helpful. Um, I'm gonna start with some questions that are uh, a little more technical um, and get those out of the way. So um, someone asked if you know if there are any tools like reverse image search that work for videos. Um, not necessarily specifically for videos, although um, one of, the, one of the, the sort of hacks or shortcuts that, that I do like to do is take a screenshot from a video and reverse image search uh, the screenshot. Um, barring that, um, doing some lateral reading um, and lateral searching based on the content of the video. So trying to identify what the central claim of a video is um, and being able to do that because chances are you may find a fact check of someone who has more advanced um, video investigation and digital forensics uh, tools has already done a fact check on it. Um, but I think sometimes when we're looking at a video, we kind of just want to take a step back and just really think about what we're looking at and just maybe kind of trust our instincts about whether or not something is true. But um, there, are, there are some video tools, I think, that will be coming in the next couple of years to make that a little easier. I do want to mention, though, that the other thing, there are apps that you can download where you can do a reverse image search from your phone. Oh, wonderful. Um, another person asked if there is a, an online seminar appropriate for college students regarding these topics. Um, mm -hmm. Do you all offer anything like this or know of anything, especially something that's free? <laughs> well, so I'm, um, I'll share the details about this in a minute, but next month, starting May 7th, we have a news literacy webinar series that we're hosting. This will be one of the topics. Um, we do have college students join those from time to time. Um, we're looking at some other options. Generally, most of our professional development focuses on educators. Um, and how they can use this to take to their students. Um, but I will, that is something we, we, uh, we do a lot, we do encourage college kids to join our webinars, but our priority is usually educators. Great. Um, another person asked whether you have the resources from the News Literacy Project available in other languages. Um, no, unfortunately we don't yet. Um, the only thing we have um, one of our lessons in the Checkology Virtual Classroom, which is called Practicing Quality Journalism, um, it's a simulation activity that teaches those standards um, to students. Um, we do have that lesson that is available entirely in Spanish, uh, but unfortunately we don't yet have those in, in other languages. Great. Um, okay, and another question that's kind of technical is about, well, <laughs> both technical and probably a long answer. What about deep fakes? How can people, deal with the growing amount of deep fakes out there. Yeah. So right now, a lot of deep, deep fakes, um, while the technology is getting, is improving seemingly every day, most deep fakes that are out there are pretty easy to spot. Um, there's a lot of visual cues um, that when you're looking at one that, that makes it pretty obvious, but the technology is getting better. Um, again, we don't necessarily have the technology, we don't really have easy to use tools to evaluate video like that. 
Um, but that's where the lateral reading comes in. That's where you can do some searching. You know, for example, if you have a, a deep fake of a politician saying something, you know, very controversial, um, you can Google that to sort of see if that person actually ever said that. Um, and so applying the, that, those lateral reading skills, getting off that video and searching to see if somebody else has already seen it. Because chances are, if you're seeing it, someone else has also seen it. And it sort of the more controversial it is, the more likely it's already been fact-checked. Right. Um, okay, so, so let's get into some other questions. There are some questions that came up earlier on in your presentation when you shared the three headlines. Mm -hmm. uh, and some specific questions about bias that I think are actually worth teasing out a little bit more. Okay. Um, so, so one person said, isn't the lack of detail in a headline part of the bias? Um, I think, yes, it can be. Um, but that, I think when we, get, when we start talking about that, we're getting a, a little bit away from some of the ways that we are trying to evaluate it objectively. Um, and some of that is about understanding how each new, how each news organization um, sort of writes their headlines. Some news organizations add a lot of detail. Others uh, keep it very minimum and focus on brevity. Um, part of it is also thinking about um, which sort of terms or phrases or details um, they add into the headline. Because I think it, I think the absence of details in and of itself is not necessarily biased. Um, I think the more important conversation is what decisions are being made about what details get included and whether or not some of the some of those facts are are sort of emphasizing a certain type of bias. Um, but again, that's one of those things that it is a very debatable subject. Um, even when we have objective standards that we can agree on, you know, subjectivity still still goes into it. Um, but hopefully when we're having those discussions, we're trying to find a way that is about you know, objective measures as opposed to just our perception and belief. It's, it's a really tricky topic. Um, and, and obviously most people can see how it can get pretty controversial pretty quickly. Right, okay, well on the tricky topics, here's another great question. We're just gonna put, uh, put you under the fire here for another minute, John. All right. um, what's the difference between strong opinion and propaganda? Um, strong opinion and propaganda. So if we're talking about a, a strong opinion, um, generally the difference is, is whether or not there's evidence to support the, the position, right? Someone who's trying to put out a strong opinion and they're trying to persuade you, um, they're going to, they hopefully will provide some sort of logic or evidence for you to evaluate to sort of judge the weight of that opinion. Um, propaganda is going to distort things. It's going to take a certain piece of information maybe spin it out of context. It may provide things that are blatantly false, depending on the, the thing. But propaganda is really trying to provoke you um, into having that emotional response. Now, you may have an emotional response to an opinion piece, but again, if it's opinion, there should be something for you to evaluate and something hopefully that you can counter with your own argument. Um, because an opinion piece should encourage discourse. This idea of sharing ideas, it should be about, well, you have that, piece of information, here's mine that, that kind of counters what you said. There should be a back and forth opportunity there um, where, where there's something for each side to evaluate. Propaganda does not have that. Propaganda is really about trying to provoke that response and trying to get us to accept something at face value from that strong emotional response. I love that. I just want to underscore something you just said that I think is not very often discussed, and that is an opinion piece should encourage discourse. That is. Mm -hmm a foundational idea that, um, that is not often discussed. And that's one of the things that I like to emphasize with teachers is that we need to try to find a way to move away from debate um, because debate implies a winner and a loser in an argument. Uh, discourse, if done right, should be more about exchanging ideas, being open to hearing new information. Even if you reject it, it's really more about that back and forth. So I, I really feel like emphasizing discourse is, is, a, is a really important part of these discussions. Yeah. Here's a, another hard question, I think. How can we address search engine bias? Oh, that gets, okay, yes, search engine bias. So that gets into uh, the discussion about algorithms um, and about personalization of information. Um, obviously, the search engines are trying to, they're trying to do two things. They're trying to match whatever you put in 
um, as closely as it can, but it's also trying to guess about what it is that you're looking for based on your personal history, your past search preferences. Um, and in some cases, they, these search algorithms may also may do some suggestions. So YouTube, for example, if I search for a topic on YouTube, one of the things that's going to pop up on the side is suggestions for other videos I might like to look for. And depending on what I search for, um, it may take me down a rabbit hole of misinformation or worse. So part of that is trying to think about effective search strategies. So trying to focus on searching for factual terms um, as opposed to sort of more loaded terms. Um, so for example, uh, using terms like best or worst um, and some of those things that will influence your search results. Um, so I think, you know, focusing on, you know, objective search terms um, as opposed to more subjective ones, um, that can go a long way towards helping with that. But again, it's really all about evaluating the results and trying to figure out what's most reliable. Yeah. Um, a quick question. Are we allowed to post these evaluation steps, the, the evaluation steps that you um, provided on? Um, sure. You, um, yes. Um, I, I, I adapted them. They're from the Stanford Research Education Group's website. Um, if you go to their website, you can register um, to see some of the materials. But those are just, you know, I use them as a guideline. Uh, but yeah, please feel free to share those questions. Uh, they're fairly simple questions that you can use to engage with information. Okay, um, and I know you, the News Literacy Project, as you said, focuses on middle and high school aged, on educators um, working with middle and high school aged students. However, um, someone said with K-12, K through 12 students migrating to virtual learning, even elementary students are going online for sources of information. Do you have resources for younger elementary students and or families on addressing bias, fact checking, and other important media literacy skills. Mm -hmm. I've heard my own elementary students, says this person, say teachers have said, for example, that they can trust websites ending with w with um, dot org. So dot org websites, right? <laughs> Your face says it all. Yeah, I mean that's a that's an old standard that applied many years ago. Is that there were more restrictions about who could re register certain domain extensions, dot org, dot us, and those. You know, those no longer apply. Anybody can register domains under those today. Um, generally, our resources, um, we design them for middle and high school students. Um, we've had teachers use them effectively as young as fifth grade. Um, my son, uh, who's in fourth grade, has actually done a couple of lessons and did pretty well. Um, but I would say that generally, I think some of the skills that we teach, some of them can be easily adapted to younger kids. Um, I think you can have a very easy conversation about news and opinion with younger students. Um, we may not want to go into some of the deeper search things or some of those, but I think that the, some of these basic skills can be used. But one of the things I'll, I'll mention, a lot of times when we talk about evaluating sources, a lot of educators will use uh, different types of checklists where you know, you, you're on a website and you go through this checklist to, to verify different pieces of information. The key thing about lateral reading is to get off of that source and find independent information. And so I think that's something that you can teach the younger people as well in a more controlled environment about how do you, how do you search for information and, and, and know what you're looking at. Um, we, we're, we are investigating some ideas about younger, uh, earlier elementary um, resources, but they're, they're really only in the design stage or early idea stage at this point. Got it. Okay, I have one last question for you. There are so many more, but we don't have time to get to them and I want you to have time to share those last resources. Mm -hmm. This is a big one and a very important one. Um, how about specific suggestions related to science news? The variety of sources, this person says, the variety of sources employed to share information related to COVID-19 is complex and can be daunting to sort through for non-scientists. Yeah, so yeah, science news can, can be especially tricky. Um, we see a lot of this with a lot of the conspiracy theories and misinformation relating to COVID-19. Um, you know, we, there's a lot of you know, miracle cures and very dangerous ideas that are being floated about that. Um, I think in general, some of these skills still apply. It's really about um, fact checking claims, um, being very careful about the source of the claims. Um, it's very easy for people to put things on a blog um, to share things on social media. I think probably one of the most important things I would emphasize though is that who is the person that's providing this information because you see a lot of people who will post something and they will say, you know, this is from Dr. So-and-so. Um, 
you need to take an extra step to sort of see, okay, so doctor of what, right? Where did you get, where did, what type of a doctor are you? Where, where did you, where, what's your certification? Um, and are you, are you qualified to be providing scientific or medical information um, on this? We see this a lot in the anti-vaccine movement. There are a lot of people who are claiming to know, have, you know, a lot of information about vaccines and vaccine safety claiming you're know, saying that they're doctors but you find out that they, you know they are a doctor of you know natural health um do, you know doctors of nutrition um and you have to be very critical about whether or not that person's qualified to talk about these things mm -hmm. um but yeah it is especially important to to apply some of these skills very carefully and i think just a little more slowly um to go through some of that information to make sure that you're really uh, verifying information carefully I'll note one, uh, one example um, that I have turned to is factcheck.org, which mm -hmm. uh, is a project of the Annenberg Public Policy Center. And they have been looking at, um, they've been fact checking coronavirus coverage specifically. So that might be a, a resource that, mm -hmm. that you all want to check out. Okay, John, um, please share your final sure. resources with us. Okay. Um, so just some of the things that we provide. So Coming up next week is our New Jersey Professional Development Series. I'll be doing this session again, but it's gonna be more geared towards educators. How do we teach that uh, to students? A couple of these are also gonna be about going deeper into some topics. So really looking at different types of misinformation, um, going into some more advanced digital verification tools, um, but then also really getting at a lot of some of these key details about understanding bias. Um, if you're an educator and you would like to register for this, um, here's the link. Um, we're, uh, Metcalf is going to send this out in the follow-up email, uh, but uh, we just opened registration. Uh, so it's all lowercase, all case, it's case sensitive, main newslet PD. Um, uh, on our website, newslet.org slash coronavirus, we are collecting and sharing all sorts of resources and information specifically about the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, some of this is information for educators. A lot of this is also for the general public. So we're publishing information here for people. Um, this is our app, Informable. It is free and ad-free on uh, Google Play or the Apple Store. Um, it is a brain training style app um, that goes through some specific skills um, about for something is ad, you know, ad or not, evidence or not, news or opinion. Um, and it goes through these different modes um, it's a very fun app, I think. We, I, I'm pretty proud of how, what we put out and how we put it together. Um, so this is something that you can do on your phones to practice some of these key skills. Um, the Checkology Virtual Classroom is our primary e-learning platform. We have dropped the paywall for uh, educators to request licenses for their students if they're affected by COVID-19 closures. Um, this is a web-based platform where uh, educators can bring these lessons to their students um, and go through a lot of these different topics and skills. Uh, one of the things that we also emphasize, we have a tool called the Check Center. Um, this goes into some of these fact-checking skills like reverse image search, lateral reading and such. Uh, so we teach and reinforce some of the skills. Um, we also have invite educators to reach out to some of our journalists. We have a number of journalist volunteers who have signed up and gone through some training to be able to talk to students either no, probably not in person anymore, but uh, you can organize uh, webinars uh, and video connections with journalists. Um, also, the SIFT is our weekly newsletter. It just went out yesterday. Um, we sort of do the time to research the trends and misinformation that are happening week to week. Um, it is geared mainly toward educators about how they can teach some of the things that are happening, um, but it's also very useful for the general public. So they can just kind of see some of the things that are happening and be a little bit more reliably informed. Right now, there's a lot about COVID-19, but it's really about misinformation um, in general. Um, so we do ask for if you we do ask for some feedback um, on this. This is mainly for for educators uh, based on this, uh, but we do invite people to give us some feedback on our presentations. Um, so I would appreciate if if you have a few minutes a bit later um, to sort of tell you what what worked, what didn't, give some suggestions. Um, we do always value feedback to help us improve our, our webinars, um, and we can go from there. So um, thank you, Sunshine. Thank you, everyone, for joining today. Uh, I really hope that you found this useful, um, and we'll be sending out some additional information uh, in a follow-up email from Metcalf soon.
Wonderful. Thank you so much, John. We really appreciate you taking time to share this incredibly useful information with us today. Thanks to all of you for joining us, and we hope that you'll come back and join us again. Uh, as a reminder, Thursday, we will be meeting once again at 1 p.m. Eastern Time um, to hear from Peter Adams, also at the News Literacy Project, about how to uh, dig a little bit more deeply and fact check like a pro. And then we'll conclude this series next Tuesday, May 5th, uh, with a, a panel featuring Susanna Gonzalez, also from the News Literacy Project, Brandon Obuno, from, a professor from um, Brown University, and um, Leisha Palin, also a professor from the University of Colorado, and we'll be discussing misinformation specifically in the context of scientific uncertainty, which we have far too much of these days. So once again, I'd like to thank our partners at the News Literacy Project, and all of you for joining us um, for this series, and we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.